Hello, hello, hello. Well, you saw my explanation. Well, he's here. Michael Rose. My adopted son. I had evoked the Honkayapi. H1K. A-Y-A-P-I, it's a Lakota ceremony. They got tired of thumping on each other and killing each other and all that, and they finally said, what are we doing? I'll tell you what, I'm gonna look after your well-being to the day I expire, and you look after mine to the day you expire, okay? And interestingly enough, blood kin unequivocally could not participate. Quite fascinating. So this son of mine, I discovered, a while ago, blew my socks off, brought him in as a virgin to the Howland Cultural Center, where he dazzled and continues to dazzle every time he comes and reads. So without further ado, notice the enunciation of the title. <laughs> further ado, for Danny K. <laughs> Michael Rose, put your seatbelts on, gang. This is the oldest soul in the room. Alrighty, I'm not going to read anything fresh, but uh, you know, everything is fresh upon rereading. <laughs> this is called Why Have I Stopped Writing? Oh, I love this piece. Let the air out of me, but my fingers slacken, flack with sheets of music, elapse, clack, clack against oak, yellow, wood guitar and find that place between myself in a moment without time and without walls. I have gone too long into a mountain in the east, you see. Gone, prayed beside the patriarch of the mind, without standing in the clay-red street market and dark and wet and mud alley walks, without the sun of the waves of the blue sandland between my body here and tomorrow and my past? Why have I let my feet stop roving? Let the words meet a halt to stand on a roadway before an old 19th century cart tipped right on over. I know that is an unfair way of putting it, but still, I have a how have 10,000 years elapsed between those finitest lines of my life while for a moment solely I gandered at a small collection of boxes flung drearily onto a roadway? Ah, uh, there I see delicate china cups emptily patter about in the pattering patterns in the January gravel. More emptily pattering then than the bounding thoughts of that Guru man from old movies who, with mastery swoons, avalanches on some mountain top of snow. And so, I tell you, I have gone too long. That is, I have laid too long, away from the love which an older version of myself, who stood beneath the cliffs, who stood beneath the falls, told me to hold on to for my own heart's shake while it beat beats to hold on to, hold up to reedy papers while it shriek, shriek, shrieks there out to ether while it heats, helps, heats, hacks, sleeps, slacks, slacks beside my inside purely by doing what it does. My heart belongs here beside the moon and the shadow of my fingers past midnight, banging on the 3 a.m. drums of low blue light and dreaming of the world beyond myself. This is called Human Lives. Human Lives. What confessions lay here beneath the grotesque city inside of the belly of time, the wine skin? What dungeons lay unwoke, what earthy secrets low lay below. The earthling in his quiet womb, he knows that the secrets there are many and unspoke are worrisome, clones the kind that some nervous verboseness 
loans. This is called, this next poem is called Poetry. Well, actually, I believe it's called Can Anyone Seize This Sun? But there's a line above it, which I'll read just for fun. Apparently, my former self said this, Poetry obscures truth, and philosophy is never understood. Aye, what a predicament we are in. <laughs> That's the thought, anyhow. The poem is called, Can Anyone Seize This Sun? Legs crossed and cool, a bitter mouth, the iron-tossed phalange, the symbolic beginning of a poem, the posture of posturing poet. This basement apartment is like a purple and gold pansy, not of summer, but of rainy Bristol, wintry, wilkes bar, brown, glistening autumn Appalachia. For months, I've not pressed the playful, amusing word of poetry into a page. My heart a loss, stirring cold stone soup, rummaging a woodland, a mist, a wood pile. Yes, I say, it's felt much like a mist. A mist not often very wide, a mist also often wider than this world and its hollow eyes and its sacred roots and its marvelous dirt, its June bugs, its bumblebees yellow light and it's green rain. Alas, anyone can seize this pine heart, absolutely anybody. The pine heart often thinks, the language bending and whispering like some circuitous breeze or gnarled trees not. Indeed, my mind has been a handful of Branches shaken and taken and shooken and shook by a seasonal shift. The pine speaks. If focus is all the magic these poems really need, why write? Why spill the sack of time for silly seeds? For anyone can write down the zen bones or the visceral groan, the tungsten or feathery throat. The pine speaks. If focus is all the magic these poems really need, why write? Why spill the sack of time for silly seeds? Anyone can clamber to the light there and lift the endless torch and sound the endless bomb. Anyone can hold the evening, can cup it in their hands, blow into it, let it fire. Smoke it to life, let it fly and swim and drift and be faint, and lift and become light like soft magic, flitter like paper in birds' wings, and let it soar and drop and perhaps climb and climb and climb. This mountain, my body is crossed and cool. It is bitter mouthed and stones blue. It is light and burning orange and sun, magma lifting, lifting. Heart's sappy odor prompts me, I think. I truly do not know if anyone can seize this kind of sun. For long I myself have not sat in the binding night. I have not unlit the pace of the buzzing, heaving, bereaving, hauling heft. Orangish, glaring, wheaten glow. Red, ripe, raving birch bark. For my part, I do not care to not jostle my tones and raise the earth to a word. A piece of me does not want for anyone to have the sun, to hold it, to kindle it, and let it fly. Oh. But if it should be so, oh, but if it should be so, thinks I, that anyone can seize the hum. Even a tiny globule of dust could learn to write. And in what craze and what smallness do you or I then derive in our pens and, and in our brogue? 
What granular size do the great things within ourselves possess, O oh Kakura? What tea have I forgot to drink tonight? What other punch has gone electric and sent me to eternity like a dull-witted fool? What zen whisk have I forgotten from the tabletop? What holy leaf have I swept away from the walkway? Aye, let it be so that the world is thus and beautiful. And let the world, if it might, and I, if I might, smile at the humility of what is right at last. And let the earth, all of it, know that that smith's name and let her or his heart soar high and sing and dawdle and ring. And let his or her mind froth and row and throng and meddle by the root of the shore-born tree like an ocean thrown foam. Let this mind perch and see the sacredest wood that is just this flower, bone, trove. If it should be that, that anyone can seize the sun, I let it finally have come. Let this mind be a flower, white and whirling petal, sweet and wet, deep black pavement after rainfall, withering in time and living in this Magnetic sun. Wow, wow, wow. This is a, a poem. This is a poem called Poems Are for the Faint of Heart. <laughs> Poems are for the faint of heart. The hearts that waver like a brick of matzo. The hearts that shake in the boots of books. Where is the time to be got from from which a novel might be written? A short story. I feel again like a lover of Trojan princesses. What might I risk for the folly of a single page? Do not the marine fleets of Agamemnon broach not upon the blue waters of our ambitions like shapely bronze spearheads? Where is my own Achilles heel? in the whispering horse or in the sails of the ships. This quaint little ship pines to leave the island's riptide and greet continents. Here, in a poem, the heart can drift and be faint and quiet and brief. Here, in a poem, the heart can muster the peace of a silent and waiting king. Um, this is a poem about my uh, former dog. I've read this before, you've heard it. I forgot the title of it. The title's on another piece of paper. <laughs> right out of space. <laughs> the hours rush past, rush and rush and rush. Song slips through out the long cosmos, like tall straws stirring coffee and cream. Very constant, I did not move. My wolf, my friend, he rests his body upon my bed, satellite ears twisting to subtle hymnals playing in the world while I wonder upon so many ivory tower questions. Meanwhile, tangles, hairs, <laughs> spill and turn over near the heaters and edges of our room. The air, cold like a sword, travels the earth of the room backward and forward, like a roaming and ghostly mist. Yellow sun comes in my fluttering drapes, Beauty floats in divine like clouds or oars upon different waters, moist and agile, yet laughing. This poem is um, called uh, Sencha, or Sincha. It's, a, it's an ode, so to speak, to, to uh, 
green tea called as Shinsha from Japan, which I like to drink. Sencha. When wine burbles, the barrels and fields drink yet again. They, after all, had built the wine. The wine is their making. I picture now the hands of the leaf rollers and pickers. I see their faces sometimes consternated, focused, other times joyous and sure, perhaps unhappy and wanting more, missing mother, regretting what they said to father. The light beats down and brings the camellia to life. She, a princess, delicately lifts her hands or shoulder or foot while the wind passes. She reads. She is beautiful, just as a princess. She is all purple in hue, like my dazzling wife. She eats curry and laughs. Not a drop tips from its plate, and her hands float, waft, fly. Like a Taoist mist, they never perch. This is the camellia, young and compassionate. I am without again my rice. I am without again my in my cup today, but I still feel the rice fields, can smell its stealthy breezes, flying near and far like so many eagles around a nest. I love the sights of the fields and the adventures of the stalks, the heroes known and the tragedies sown, the spirits come and gone. So much history cast in all its lights, yellow and blue and red and green, so much time, so many people, so many, many people. This is what my cup brings on any given day, a vast, and particulate history. Can you picture the eyes of our princess as she watches those other princesses of the fields, the lay folk working each day to bring the harvest into teacups? I am no princess, thinks Camellia. We all are such in our beautiful humanity. I picture the mesh bowl shaking small debris away, the room drying all the leaves, the many fingers lightly rolling the leaves between their hands to break the leaf, but not completely, only just enough. Even the factory in its delicate, excuse me, even the factory is delicate in its own way with its conveyor belts and steam systems and its hulling mechanisms churning in the fields. Even there an eye and a hand must greet the plant, and nitrogen must lift the heads of stalks just right. I could go on and on. I've barely spoken of the moon and her eyes and gaze at night, her gentle croon, the words of comfort she lets down in golden curl to the soil and plant the warm white hands unfurled. Ah, yes, the tea it sings of my mother, sitting beside me just wishing to talk further, wanting for a son to hear the orchestras of the heart a moment longer. And she would gently scratch my back and sing of Killarney then, my mother, a moon herself. Divorce and I miss my children, are tight on the lips of Mother Moon. Even so, there is a love of the role between child and mother, irrespective of context and overflowing with contents. For we are mother and son in every moment. Nature has written this, and our life energies build this. Similarly, there is a bond between moon and field, and insect and wind, and temperature, and leaf, and worker, and brew, and taste, and finally, poem. 
This tea is such an overdue delight, even in its jazzy blues. Its luminescent memory spills from the lake of the water. I am glad for every moment. I am grateful for every word and feeling stirred while I lay upon the bed with its sky blue sheet, wrinkly like an ocean stew. Upon the surface, I, a bobbing rowboat, muse. And with that, I will conclude my reading for this evening. I love this genius. Absolutely humbles me. This is the Howland Cultural Center. Um, we had remarkable readers tonight. All are welcome. Mm -hmm. I will keep you apprised if we're still invite only. Hopefully this fantasy plague will pass and we'll be able to congregate as we once did. And uh, we will be second Fridays at 7. See you then.